So we're going to move on to the Hib and the Prevnar. So we've done hepatitis B, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. We're going on to Hib. Okay. What H. flu is, okay, it's the, uh, the, this particular vaccine is for a bacterial infection caused by uh, a bacteria called um, Haemophilus influenza type B. And it, during the uh, 1990s, it was the most common cause of bacterial meningitis in kids under the age of five. And there were about 12,000 cases a year. Up to 5% of kids died from it. Neurological complications were seen in up to 35% of survivors. And most of the neurological complication was hearing loss. That was the most common thing that was seen. Now, the good news is, is that since the Hib vaccine was introduced um, in 1991, the incidence of Hib meningitis has declined by at least 95%. I mean, the incidence rate has gone down to like almost zero. And I remember that. I remember that as an ER doc, that of cases of seeing cases of H. flu meningitis in kids under the age of two or three, and that after this vaccine came out, it just stopped. You just didn't see it anymore. Okay? And the reason for that is because of the type of vaccine that this is. It's, it's what's instead of like with, dip, uh, with diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, where we inject that toxoid and develop an antibody to that toxoid, and with, say, measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, and polio, those are all viral vaccines that we actually inject the virus into the babies. With Hib and with Prevnar, it's a type of vaccine called a cell wall antigen vaccine. So if this were the bacteria, it actually actually take a little sequence off the side of the bacteria and inject that. Okay. Now the body develops an antibody to that, so when the bacteria shows up, it goes and finds that sequence and attaches to it and kills the bacteria. Remember that diagram I showed you about that with the molecular mimicry? That's how it works, is that antibody goes and it finds that bacteria and it kills it. So you're not injecting bacterial DNA, you're not injecting viral DNA, you're injecting a little piece of the cell wall of the bacteria, so you're injecting a little piece of the bacteria to develop the antibody to that. So when when Hib, when that, when that, or when the H flu, H flu type B was around, and we had a lot of it around, that you know that those bacteria, those antibodies could go and find it and kill it. We killed it, and a lot of those kids. And the Hib came out. The the good form of Hib that we're using now came out in 1991. When that happened, that incidence of that that bacteria just went away. We just killed it. It just all went away. So that was a good thing. I mean, we stopped seeing that meningitis in those kids during that period of time. Now, H. flu as a bacteria is it's just not cultured anymore. You just don't see it. It's just gone. Now, the bad news about that is that they studied over 200,000 kids, and most of this was done in South America, and they looked at doses of, the, of kids that had somewhere between one and four doses of the Hib vaccine. And after seven years, the group receiving four doses had a statistically significant increased rate of type 1 diabetes compared to children who did not receive the vaccine. Almost all cases of diabetes occurred three to four years after vaccination. Okay? And then there was another paper that said the same thing, but it was too small to, speak, to have statistical significance. This were Klassen's work um, published in the Journal of Autoimmunity, which is a peer-reviewed conventional medical journal that most of conventional medicine has sort of done to Klassen what they kind of have done to Andy Wakefield. They've said his, his, his research was bad, we can't, there's no statistical evidence or all those things. Now, how did this happen? Well, we've already talked about it. It's like that, it's that molecular mimicry thing. You know, we've got those antibodies to that Hib bacteria. There's no, more Hib bac or there's no more H. flu bacteria floating around. Do you think there's a possibility that they find that sequence on the, on the pancreas and goes and starts to kill it? Because that ABC sequence, like we had off of that diagram, is the same thing on the pancreas as on the bacteria. Okay. We have great, and now the other bad news is that we have great concern for the increasing prevalence, relatively or absolutely, of the penicillin resistance pneumococcus bacteria, the strep bacteria, because we've killed off all the gram negative Hib. So we had this balance between H flu and strep, and the gram negative, the H flu, and the gram positive strep kind of kept each other in balance, and we took away the gram negative, so now the gram positives are all kind of going crazy. So now what do we do with that? And we need a new vaccine. Okay. And now what we need is another vaccine to kill off all the gram positives. Okay. And there's more than 80 different kinds of those, and they've, and they've had some, more, and the pneumococcal meningitis has been associated with a really low rate of mortality. Is it reasonable to expect your child could be one of these victims? Could it be one of those people? Well, let me see what the CDC says about that. 
Invasive pneumococcal infections are more likely to occur when predisposing conditions exist. Immune deficiency, cancer, congenital abnormalities, HIV, some viral respiratory infections that are really serious, spleen dysfunctions, no spleen, or organ transplants. Now, if your kids have any of those, they're at high risk, they're at higher risk of having strep meningitis. If they don't have those, they're pretty low risk. So is it really real to think that we need to have the Prevnar to protect your kids from invasive strep disease? Most healthy kids, especially infants, don't have those conditions, so they're not going to be at high risk. Do you follow that? Okay. So what's in Prevnar? Well, Prevnar contains seven different strains of strep pneumonia, so that's like getting seven vaccines in one shot. Okay. Each strain is grown in soy, purified with cell wall antigens, treated with chemicals, and then bound to diphtheria. So kids get another whole dose of diphtheria with that. And each dose contains bacteria and diphtheria stuff. In addition, each dose of Prevnar has 1.25 or 0.125 milligrams of aluminum, considered neurotoxic in humans. And the American Academy of Pediatrics says aluminum is now being implicated as interfering with a variety of cellular and metabolic processes in the nervous system and other tissues. Okay, this comes from a really this comes from pediatrics. It's from, you know, the journal Pediatrics saying, "Gosh, we need to be looking at this aluminum issue." Now, here's a news flash, okay? 